Brandon Branch. Uh, like I said, I have local lines TV. We film on Waypoint, but I also have Crystal River Fishing Company. I specialize in shallow water grouper fishing and snook fishing on the Nature Coast, but I do it all redfish, trout, snook, triple tail, tarpon, but I do specialize in the grouper stuff, um, and that's what I'll be talking about mostly today. James? Here, Captain look. James Kerr. Yep, yeah, uh, I'm uh, Captain not, James. Let's not walk over the yeah, we'll let you guys watch the podium. I'm uh, Captain James Kerr. Um, the fishing here for a while. I specialize in, uh, I like chasing redfish and snook and trout, but uh, I do all inshore. Um, you, my website is crystalriverfishingpros.com. You can find myself and a handful of other guys that have the plantation on there. And like I said, I'll mainly be talking about redfish, trout, and stuff. JC, you're up next. Captain JC, uh, I run Nature Coast Fin and Feather. Uh, I do Everything from tarpon fly fishing to duck hunts and shallow water redfish. Uh, been doing it for a little while now. It's, do a little bit of everything: grouper, snook, redfish, tarpon, trout. Well, it's all. Adam. Captain Adam Maye. I mostly run out of Homosassa. I. Uh, I'm a fly guy. I only do shallow water, redfish, snook, and tarpon fly fishing trips. Got the Dallas King. <clears throat> hey guys, I'm uh, Captain Dallas King. Um, I love fishing. <laughs> it's all awesome. Um, I really love uh, snook, redfish, all the inshore stuff. Uh, mud boat season's coming up, so I'm really looking forward to that. It's that super, super shallow water. Backcountry stuff. I've been running that uh, three or four years in the winter, and uh, I love it. Uh, I'm with uh, James, JC, our buddy Captain Glenn, who's not here. Crystal River Fishing Pros.com. That's our website. You can check us out on there. And uh, again, thank all you guys for coming. All right, and we have two other guys that are going to be here uh, Captain Jeremiah Carlucci. Sock should be walking in any time. And Captain Socrates. Everyone knows, or I know him as Captain Waffles. <laughs> we'll, we'll rip them about being Captain Waffles. All right. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to have these gentlemen take up their chairs and bring them out, unless there's an extra chair at all these tables, which I don't think there is an extra chair. Uh, just take your chairs. And guys, try to sit in the first you know, four deep here. Um, each go to a different table, and that way I'm not crowding you. And you guys know, can it's sit. Too, too three, 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 with everyone. We are going to have a raffle you know, within this right. class as well, just so you guys know. Um, we've got a power pucks to raffle off. We've got like eight or nine pairs of sunglasses, high end sunglasses. So I don't have to go far. So, Dallas, you can go wherever you can go right there if you want to. Bring a chair. Yeah, just bring a bring a chair. Anyway. We're gonna we're gonna. You see this chair right here? We're going to put it like this for Carlucci when he gets here. Right in the <laughs> Trust me, he's used to it. He's used to it. In fact, when Casey came in, I asked him, I was like, what do you think about having these pros sit at the tables? And um, he goes, I think it's a good idea. Would you have them sit in the first, first eight tables or so? I go, yeah, we'll do that. I go, but you know Jeremiah's going to want to go right to the back because that's where he was in school. That's where he was on the bus. <laughs> there he is, Captain Waffles himself. <laughs> well, I'm going to make you come up here and get squirmy right away because I'm going to have you introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> How are we doing? We're doing good. Thank you for coming. Yes, sir. Uh, where can I put these? Take care. I'm Captain Socrates. Uh, been guiding out of here for about two and a half years now, fishing out of here my whole life, and I guess I'm going to share some knowledge with you guys, just some tips and techniques and how we like to fish around here, how I like to fish around here, and uh, I know the other guys that are in here, all excellent guides, uh, probably going to get a lot out of this talk, of this seminar. They are. Don't let his small size fool you. He only catches giant fish. <laughs> Find a table that there's not another pro and sit with them. Okay. Yep, you can sit right up here. We've got two chairs up here for you. All right. The way we do this, um, for some of you that weren't here, we were talking why we were doing this. We are talking about this is our opportunity, why the momentum is there to raise money for the Florida Disaster Fund. 
which uh, the first lady of the state, Casey DeSantis, is heading up, and that creates a lot less bureaucratic red tape that the government would make these folks jump through a lot of boxes to get their FEMA money and get some of their emergency fund money. Because um, that stuff doesn't happen in days. Lots of time that takes weeks or even months to get those dollars. So she's up to, Rick said, 40 mil. 40 mil she's yeah. up to 40 million right now. Um, if there are other ones that you'd like to participate in, I encourage everyone to go to captainsforcleanwater.org because they have two funds on there that does the exact same thing. And uh, in fact, my next effort to uh, raise money will be for the Captains for Clean Water group for the guides because they have a guide fund on there because I know what they're going to be up against. All right, I've got 100 questions here that I'm going to ask these guys. And I'm not going to have everyone answer the question unless they answer it too short for me. And then I will let at some point, I'm going to jump around with these questions. They're all over. So one question might be grouper. The next one might be speckled trout. The next one might be about sunglasses or equipment. Um, first question, uh, what's your best advice for a new angler fishing our area? And, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let Captain James Kirby, the first one to answer that. If I were to come to you and I was a brand new angler, what advice would you give me to? Well, I would say, uh, probably hire a guide the first time, maybe to see if you can really, uh, you know see what it's like out there and i would say i would try to go at the lowest of tides i mean and just take your time with uh navigating you know even if you have to idle you know so you get you know good tracks because yeah. our area um you get a weak moon uh it's, it's wind driven you get an east wind northeast wind even sometimes a southeast wind um it will dry this place up and it can be you know uh it can be dangerous, um, you know, especially pretty much from this time all the way till we get back into the spring again, you know. So the best thing to do is to get out there and take your time with, you know, um, just navigating. I mean, that's probably the best advice I can say. And um, do it on low water. Everybody says, yeah, I can go on high water, but everybody can go on high water. That's right. When I say, like yesterday, I ran from Mango Point all the way down the Rock Island Channel. And it was that deep, I'm doing 35 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, and having the right boat. Yeah. You know, the right equipment. To well, we're, we're, and we're, and we're going to cover all those. You're getting ahead of it a little bit. Dallas, right. I'm going I'm to have you answer this oh, question man. as well. <laughs> uh, I think the easiest thing for that, James said a lot of the, the best points, um, but hire a guy. Keep us all working here. Not for our spots. <laughs> but uh, there is no replacement. For the amount of time you spend on the water we're out there most of us are out there almost 280 days a year um, we learn something new almost every day uh, just time on the water is probably your best friend and throughout a whole year of doing it you're going to see all sorts of changes if you go in january it is not going to be in july what you learned in january everything's going to shift everything's going to change so there's there's so much more to it than just getting out there and hooking a fish. You got to spend that time out there and uh, and figure it out. Low and slow, low and slow, especially with our rocky area. Take your time. Don't get ahead of yourself, and uh, and believe in yourself. It'll happen. You just got to put the time in out there. Again. All right. Here's another question. Pros, in your opinion, what are the most productive months to fish here? Now I know because you guys want to guide 12 months a year. It's a every month. <laughs> but if you had to choose two or three months, what months would they be? Would be the most productive, JC? I'd have to say spring. Spring months. Spring time, at, uh, like March, April, May. Mm -hmm. It's, dark. it's cooling down, but it's starting to get warmer again. Fish are hungry. Fish are hungry. Fish are hungry. Yeah. Brandon? I would have to say March and April or October, November. They're both really good months. It depends on what you want to target. Um, the redfish, trout, snook. The March and April months, you can target basically everything is here. Right. Kobe are starting to show up in April. Your snook, your trout, your redfish are biting very, very well. Um, triple tail. You can catch a triple tail in March. So it's the variety of species you can catch that time of year is really, really good. Now, if you're a group of fishermen, October, November are going to be great months. 
awesome. We're catching a pile of fish really quick, getting chances to come back in and see some of the best redfish action of the year. Yeah. This time of year, those fish are coming through. They're migrating to spawn. We're seeing big schools of fish this time of year. Um, and like I said, by next month, you'll be seeing the variety. The trout will be moving in shore. You can catch the trout, redfish, and snook all in the same exact places those two times of the year. As in the summertime, you'll have your trout offshore and you'll have your redfish inshore. The snook are kind of scattered. There's some inshore, there's some offshore spawning. But those months, you can really target all species um, at one time. At one time. And I would tend to agree with all this, what they said because the springtime and the fall are my favorite times to fish here. Uh, I'm not here in the summertime because I'm somewhere else. In the wintertime, it's just, it seems like it's cold and windy and dreary all the time. Next question, guide question for pros. Biggest pet peeve as a professional guide that clients consistently exhibit? <laughs> Sock. <laughs> and throw you under the bus. And remember, Donnie is in the room. Hey, uh, <laughs> Donnie, Donnie's one of those guys that, you know, he, he knows the drill. He's been with me enough. Uh, not, you know, just some little things like casting. Uh, right, right. <laughs> yeah, slamming the cooler lid really hard when we're pushing in on fish, uh, but a lot of it comes to the cats, you know, and I try and, I try and coach my people, you know, if I, if I see them slamming the reel shut, yeah. I, you know, trying to engage the bail with the reel instead of flipping it by hand, you know, that's kind of a big pet peeve of mine, because it creates wing knots, and, you know, it, the reels, I, I don't think they're really made nowadays to be the bale flipped over like that. Um, so in general, you're annoyed all day. <laughs> <laughs> some days, some days, yeah. Just when they're casting. But, okay, uh, I'm going to have Captain Adam Maya answer this question too. So my biggest one would be lack of honesty about your ability. <laughs> I don't mean that in a mean way, but if we're going on a fly fishing yes. trip and you tell me you can cast 70 feet and in reality you can cast 20 feet, we need to mitigate your expectations and spend a lot more time in that charter learning how to cast instead of catching fish. Cause to, to catch fish on fly, you need to be able to cast more than 20 feet around here. And I have a lot of people that on the phone can cast a really long ways. And then, <laughs> and then on the boat, they can cast two rod lengths. And it, that, that would be my biggest peeve. And I'm fine if you can only cast 20 feet. I just would like to go into the trip knowing that ahead of time, because then we're going to turn it into more of a learning experience than an actual fishing experience, at least, at least for the first half of the trip. I agree. I mean, those, those are those are exactly what would bother me. Um, the uh, the casting in the redundant position all the time, where when you're push pulling someone along an edge and they consistently cast doing the same thing all the time, instead of hey, oh, I better throw one out here to keep them honest or throw one straight ahead of the boat. You're constantly reminding them to do that, but if you don't, they'll keep doing the same thing because it's a comfortable cast and they've got the timing down so they don't want to change it. So then you're trying to change the way you position the boat so that you can get the most out of them. Here's a good one. Uh, high tide comes and fish vaporize. We've all experienced that here. Where do they go? Dallas. <laughs> Where do they go? That's a great question. Uh, I mean, I love high tide. I, I fish reds and snook, and uh, they definitely turn off. There's definitely that uh, that wall that happens until the water starts moving again. Um, I did a, a little seminar at the plantation not long ago, uh, middle of July. It's hot, and uh, a lot of people ask, well, where are they? And I said, they're in the shade. you got to start pitching. I grew up bass fishing a lot, uh, especially on the St. John's River. Uh, tournament bass fish with my dad a lot. Uh, and it was great. And guess what? All sorts of fish like shade when it's hot. If that water temp's 90 degrees, they're going to be just like you and me wanting to get in that shade. So that tide comes way up high. Find you some bushes where you can pitch something up under there. Uh, I'll even bring a bait caster. A big old flipping stick. Pitch a bait up in there. Boom. And that tends to help out a lot. Um, other than that, yeah, the fish will just shut down. Spend another hour, wait till that tide turns. 
Uh, that's, uh, that's about it on that one, I think. Brandon, you answer the same question. Get the high water, moves them around. Where do they go? Under the bushes, like you said, I fish a lot. Um, I look for the current on the high tide. The current breaks, the mm -hmm. mullet jumping, um, but definitely up under the bushes. But now with pressure, some people think those fish are going up under the bushes or you're having to fish close. Those fish stay way off on high tide sometimes. I mean, I learned it more in Steenahatchee and Swanee and things like that, up even to Keaton. Those fish aren't against the bank on high tide. You don't have to go. Some of them follow, but you can fish off the bank. I mean, they're not going to always be right up on the bushes on that high water. I like to start way off, um, maybe 100 yards off, and then work my way in, and you're eventually going to find the fish to where you can repeat it. Yeah, maybe, maybe they relate to a different type of cover, a rock pile, a drop off, something like that. They still are on a ridge. That's the kind of good stuff that we're after today. Yeah. All right, uh, here's something a little bit different. Dock fishing in Crystal River and Homosassa River, is it very productive, and what's the best time for this scenario? Adam, I'm going to have you answer this one first because you're right there at Homosassa. So in the Homosassa River, I fish, I really only resort to fishing docks on bad weather days when I can't, can't effectively fish the outside. I fish the docks only in the winter time because I find a lot of the snook and really largemouth bass too. They push up river toward the springs the colder it gets. So really from the monkey bar area upstream is it's pretty productive for me all winter long and it's it's a good option if the wind's blowing because it's a lot easier to find shelter in the river than it is out on the flat. Good answer. Sock, you answer this one too. Yeah, I like to fish dogs for big snook. You know, they love the structure. We don't have a lot of docks here in our zone. You know, it's not like Tampa Bay or mm -hmm. some of the other places where you can just make a day out of fishing docks. There's a handful of docks that, you know, deep water, fast current, uh, but like I live on the river. I live on, I live on a canal full of docks in the canal. The canals just don't seem to hold, you know, we get bass in our canals, but red, as far as redfish and snook, and I, I even have a dock light. My neighbors have dock lights. The fish up here, for some reason, they really don't respond to the green lights like they do. South and I here. think it's something with the fresh water, you know, or maybe not much current flow in the canals, but uh, the dock fishing up here is different. Sheep's head, you can catch a lot of sheep's head off the docks, uh, but you know, the dock fishing is a little different up here. That, but you you can go up in the bay and catch bass, redfish, and snook, you know, skipping plastics under certain docks. Okay. Jeremiah, I've got your chair right up here in the corner. <laughs> no, Jeremiah, pick a chair. Pick a chair in the back of the room with one of these tables, because um, I'm going to put you on the spot for a question here. Well, I'm saying that there's no more chairs. No, there's some more chairs. We can give you the corner chair here that we save for you. We'll give you a chair. <laughs> We already called the high school thing. We knew exactly where you were going. <laughs> this is Captain Jeremiah Carlucci. Crystal River Fishing. All right. Jeremiah, tell me when you're comfortable because I'm gonna I'm gonna this one's gonna be for you. I got two, I got two of you, I got mine for this one. Creek fishing is intense during the cooler months. What's the best method to locating fish in these zones, and are there any clues that make one creek better than another? Well, obviously, you know, the mullet's always your key. You've got to look at the bait, obviously. As the tide comes in, you know, the fish are going to be right behind them. It's definitely going to be a lot shallower, so, you know, you're able to sneak up on these fish a lot easier. Um, I kind of like looking for the creeks that have divots and little potholes in them, and that's usually going to be... Yeah, the best that I see that I do. Okay, JC, I'm gonna have you answer that same question because I know you're a creek guy too. Yeah. 
I was they pull up the mullet aspect. I, I watch for those tricks that the mullet like to follow into and continue on with the tide. And I like to either stay ahead of them or just trailing behind the mullet. And I like the creeks with a pothole or a hard turn with a like rock bottom, you know, rock, rock bottom. Your rock bottom. Water kind of slams into those turns. And current. And current. Can I add one thing? That sure. For all the time. Um, on the low water, when it's dry and starts to come in, if you see those white birds, especially a good amount of white birds standing in the creek, they are feeding on the crabs, the shrimp, um, any crustaceans that those redfish are going to be feeding on. That is something I look for a lot, is those white birds. You can run down creek to creek, and when you see a creek with a bunch of white birds, a lot of times those redfish are going to be right behind them. Yeah. Because they're eating all the dying invertebrates and crabs and things that when the flat dried out, now the water's going to come back. And honest to God, those the, the life cycle of those creatures isn't that long. So when the water comes up over the top of them, that's just like wafting cookies and baked goods and stuff like that. And those redfish go right to it, right to it. All right, another question. Um, In your opinion, guys, is there a navigational aid that makes fishing the nature coast trouble free? <laughs> Jeremiah, since you missed out on a few, I'm going to let you answer this one again first. I would say just follow me and you'll be safe. <laughs> <laughs> did, you bring, did you bring your boat? I actually did have to work on it. That's why I'm late. So go look at his trim tabs. <clears throat> Go look at a skate. Oh, you don't have a skate, that's right. I'm gonna. Box. I'm also gonna ask James Kerr this question too, because his boat seems like it doesn't have too much stuff wrong with it. So, James, <laughs> what do you say? Well, I don't drive over dry land. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was the question again? Refresh it again. Sorry. It says, in your opinion, is there a navigational aid that makes fishing the nature coast trouble free. And where I'm going with this is like Florida marine tracks that yeah. people get in a lot of confidence. I don't, I mean, I just think time on the water and just, you know, a lot of mental notes. You know, I look for like certain rocks and even uh, like finger roots, JC, and uh, I look for stuff like that, you know. Um, I use a lot of mental notes. Like I know if, I, if this rock's just under, I can get back into this area. Right. Um, but as far as navigational aids, I mean. So these are like bellwether things you see where a rock is exposed or not exposed, then that means, oh, I can get to the back of that creek. I can get over there. But, but I mean, Florida Marine Track, that's a great product. Um, you know, and all these machines, you know, they, they definitely came light years mm -hmm. from what they used to be. Those things do help, but... You still, you got it. There's an element of local knowledge. You have to know where... There's, I mean, I've, I've been fishing here since 2007, and I still, like, these guys have been there their whole life. I mean, to this day, I, every winter, I always find a new rock. <laughs> well, you'll have you'll have like you know, the grass and stuff that grows on it, and it gets cleaned off, and then I mean, you've been driving by that for ten years, and yeah. now it's there's a rock there. Yeah. You know, so mental mental notes for me is what I, you know, mainly rely. I do a lot of nighttime driving too, like in the pitch black, and that's when I guess the, that's not recommended, by the way. <laughs> it, it's not, but I mean, I get out there before the sun's up, and I'm ready to go. Yes. Yeah. You know, or fish from four till nine ten nine ten o'clock at night. You know, so. That's when I guess those navigational aids, like the like Florida Marine Tracks or whatever you use, probably would be a good thing. You know okay. what I mean? Um, here's the next question, pros. So many believe that fishing just before the front arrives gives you the chance for some incredible fishing opportunities. Is that true? Is that really true? Brandon, you answer it first. Absolutely. Um, when that pressure is changing, I think that's a... The, one of the best times to be on the water um, just before the hurricane came. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was phenomenal. I went to pull my traps in because I didn't want to, I didn't know what to expect, and right. um, I had a bunch of bait, and I stopped, and it, it was the best fishing that I have seen all year for River yet, and I'm a firm believer that that is why the pressure changing the fish, the fish can feel it coming before we can see it coming, in my opinion. Right. Um, they know what's happening. And you can always see a couple days after the front, especially a big northeaster in the winter or winter time when the sun's high. Mm -hmm. It can be very tough fishing. Yeah. Uh, so definitely, I would if it was me and I was trying to pick some days to go fishing, I would try to pick it ahead of the front. Yep. Yep. 
Um, sock, same question. I mean, yeah, the, the, especially being out there every day, you get to see, and I follow the barometric pressure very closely. I have an app and it shows everything. And you'll have your biggest fish are going to bite before that front, always. I, all of the biggest snook just about that I've caught right before a big front's coming through, that pressure's changing, they're eating, uh, some, you know, big number of days. Uh, and a lot of times you'll find that they'll eat artificial really well as the front's coming in. And I'm talking, I will fish up until it's on me. Right. You know, and then afterwards, that northwest wind, I call it the dreaded northwest <laughs> because, you know, Pressure spikes, it levels out, and the fish just shut off. All right, next question, pros. Favorite line to leader connection knot, and why is it your favorite? Adam, you first. I use a double blood knot, just blood to blood, and I I don't have a reason why it's the best, but in all of my fly fishermen, <laughs> in, 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 in all of my years of fishing, it's never failed me. And I know a lot of people use a lot of different knots, but mm -hmm. I can tie that blindfolded, and I've never had a failure out of it. Mm -hmm. So I trust it. That's why I use it. JC, I use the all rug a lot. Okay. Especially for my braid and my leader. Okay. I don't have any issues with it. No issues with it. I'm not wondering why. I'm gonna let one more person answer this, Dallas. Um, it's funny, you'll get three different answers. I yeah. I do <laughs> that's, a, that's why I want to do it. That way. <laughs> I do a double uni. Um, I use 10 pound braid on almost everything to a 30 to 40 pound leader for almost everything. Uh, I think if you go lighter, like 8 pound uh, leader or 8 pound uh, main line to like a 20 pound, you should probably change it up, use something else because it can slip a little bit. But uh, that's what I sling for everything. On, on a daily basis, just double uni. Double uni. It's easy, it's quick. Um, customers break off all the time, a lot, <laughs> a lot. So you get real, real comfortable time and quick knot that takes you 20 seconds to do. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> and I mean, this this coast here eats jigs. Any weighted anything, it just seems like when you're fishing with clients, if they haven't mastered the ability to feather line and get to the real quick, um, it's hung in the bottom. And you can bow and arrow it a few times trying to get it off, and it doesn't, you've got to pop it off, and, and it is nice to have a quick knot for that. Tailing redfish on the nature coast. Does it happen, and what's the best time of year for this scenario to take place? Jeremiah. It used to happen a lot more, but now there's so many beds with pressure. But it still does happen quite a bit, and it comes up, we're coming up on the time of fall where, you know, like Brian was talking about the white birds, usually them. Fish are following the tides and getting the tail on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, you know, this is my favorite time coming up in about November to April, and you'll get to see some tail on reds. So. James? Um, the only time that I've ever done was with uh, Captain Socrates, and that was in, uh, I think it was a just blowout tide back there in the creek, you know. Um, you almost slipped up and gave away where? Well, yeah, because I could see him. He was yeah. one. There's only a couple places that they do tail. That's and, true. Uh, That's true. I mean, that was the only time I've really, I've really ever done it when mm -hmm. we cap sock, but um, <laughs> I've always not had. I've never had the opportunity to get back there and and do that. You know. Again, James boat's in very good shape. It looks nice. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You check out. Jeremiah's boat, Sock's boat, then you'll know why they get there. Yes, ma'am. What do you mean by tailing redfish? So tailing redfish. This is this is a behavior where the redfish in, in low water scenarios, they're always tailing. They're just tailing underneath the water. But when they go to look for forage, they will lower their head down in the grass or down in the mud bottom, and they root around. And when they do that, their tails will kind of break the surface of the water, and you see them in it. Grown men almost come to their knees. Uh, I'm watching Shipley. Oh my God! You're talking about tailing redfish. It'll bring them to their knees. All right. Here's another question. Gator trout are considered what size in this region, and when and what technique works best to catch them? This could be fly, artificial, or 
or anything else. But gator trout are considered what size in this region and when and what technique works best. JC. I like throwing hard baits for them for some of the soft uh, Paul Browns. Paul Browns, yeah. They're one of my favorites. But a gator trout for me is anything over 24 inches. Anything over 24. Good to know. Um, Brandon, I'll let you answer this question too, because I know you move around catching gator trout. But I do. It's one of my favorite things to target, especially throwing top waters or anything on the surface. Um, February, March, and April are my three favorite months to catch them. I fish the Steenahatchee to Keaton, the Spring Warrior area a lot. Um, and I'm looking, most of those big trout that I'm catching are in less than two feet of water. On the hard bottom, the little tiny potholes, um, even here, those three months are going to be really good. Like JC said, throwing the hard baits, but I really like to throw something that you have to fish in shallow water, a top water, or something, a floating bait. Yeah, something uh, stays up high. Something that stays high in that shallow water. My biggest trout that I've ever caught have come in less than a foot of water. Uh, especially in Senahatchee, it's a lot easier place to fish because you're drifting those flats. You don't have to be in the creeks. There's not, there is some rocks, but it's not as hard. You can make really long drifts there on that skinny water and basically never have to use your trolling motor or you can just drift and catch them for miles. Um, but yeah, those three months are when you're going to find those fish with eggs in them. I do try to handle them really, really careful that time of year, especially those big 20, 20 inch and above. I'm really, really careful with because those fish are holding eggs that time of year. That's when you'll find your heaviest trout. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a big uh, initiative that you probably see on social media now called Release Over 20. If you're going to keep trout, keep the ones that are under 20 inches. They don't produce nearly as many um, eggs. And uh, that's what keeps your trout populations happy. And that's, you know, that's the blue collar. That's the working man's fish. That's what everyone wants to catch out here. And we have some incredible trout fishing out here. Um, what signs of life do you look for to locate game fish of any type? What's your signs of life? B said something about it earlier, but I'm going to go to Adam on this one. Signs of life. Mullet. Mullet. Mullet is my number one indicator when I'm on the flats. If I'm pulling a flat and I don't see any mullet, I usually pack up and go to a different flat. That's it. They're, they're that important. Good good piece of advice. Jeremiah? Well, it's funny. Yesterday, mullet too, but yesterday I was on my way out and I seen a pile of ducks, you know, conorans and white seagulls diving and I'm looking just all these little pops bait. Found them to stop, stop. First three casts, I keep the trout for me. They're just lady fish. They were all just mixed up together. And yep. They're kind of, they're yeah. kind of making their way in. So a crowd, a crowd draws a crowd, yep. so to speak. Dallas, what do you look for? Um, these guys covered it a lot. Um, I'll give you something that that I just talked about the other day to my clients. Um, if you're in a spot and you know it's starting to get trouty, it's that time of year, and uh, you start catching lady fish. I really think that they are peas in a pod. If you can stand catching a handful and them making you mad, sliding up your boat, pooping on you, all that, <laughs> if you can fish through them, I, I like when I catch uh, ladyfish because I know there's got to be trout around. Uh, I think they're peas in a pod, and I, I think that's something that's, uh, that can be added to what, what was said and, and help. If you can stand, them sign me up. <laughs> if you can stand it, then they'll be there with them. Here, here, here's an artificial lore question. Does artificial scents like Procure or anything else? It could be Carolina Lunker sauce or Gulf or whatnot. But does artificial scents like Procure give anglers an advantage? Yes or no? I'm going to let JC. To be honest, I haven't really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no. So obviously it doesn't matter to you. So. <laughs> I'd like, to, I'd like to try it on a few things. Yeah. In the uh, in the winter time, especially when I'm fishing for trout, mm -hmm. um, I always wipe a little bit on my mirror jeans, um, and it, I use the uh, DOA drip baits as well. They have like a little, a little fold that's inside there. I'll, I'll mm -hmm. put a little bit in there, you know, because in the winter time when it's real cold, I throw those baits out and I barely move them. So I think anything that is uh, uh, that's scented, I think it's going to help. And I do a lot of dead sticking. You know, sometimes yeah. I spend my fish for trout, just do a couple of twitches. And let it and let, let it suspend. Let it just sit there. And I think it I think it gives an advantage. I mean, especially when they go to bite it, you know, maybe sometimes, you know, trout they like to 
they short strike some things, you know. Stop. What, what do you think? I know you got five baskets of live bait behind your house, but when you do use an artificial, no, do you cheat? I, like James just said, in the winter time, when we're fishing baits a lot slower, yeah. and especially soft plastics. I used to put it on, when I was younger, I'd put it on skitter walks and stuff, mm -hmm. but it would peel the paint off of my Younger, heart. like two years ago, or? <laughs> like 15 years ago. But uh, they, I think it works in, in the cooler months when you're fishing baits a lot slower. Uh, summertime, we're going to be moving the bait so quick that, you know, I don't think it's more of a reaction strike. Uh, and I, I'm of the same belief. I, I think that scent, if you're going to add scent, whether it be hard baits or, or soft baits, that you don't need as much as you think you do, for one, because um, the fish can pick up scent just like your wife can tell if you've been somewhere. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say yes. For sure, I would use scent in the wintertime. And oftentimes, I'll take, like, if I think it's going to give me an advantage, especially dead sticking, I'll take a bag of baits, dump them in a Ziploc bag, you put two drops of Procure in there, and just let them kind of just sit in there in that Procure and pull the ones out that I need. Now to hold on to those things to rig them is a whole nother thing. You almost need the end of your shirt or something. That's where your wife comes in and says, well, what were you <laughs> Okay. All right, let's go back here. Um, let's talk about triple tail. Do triple tail get more plentiful further offshore? And do you ever see them in the creeks, Jeremiah? Um, it just kind of depends on the time of the year. I used to <clears throat> stay really in shore, but last one it was really cold. <clears throat> it was a really big one, just all the way into the Fish Creek boat ramp. Yeah. Kind of got lost, I think. They just moved around. I mean, after this storm, there's a bunch of foot debris and Lake House, and he went out there and it was like a whole migration of them just coming back back to the south so yeah. um yeah as of right now crab duties are all out there so we'll probably start seeing a lot more but you see less in the summer yeah after stone crab season because there's you know usually that's no spring and then late summer early fall is when you see the most right i would have to say it depends on where the fish are at and where you're at um <clears throat> the yankee town cedar key swanee area which is going to be your summer months for triple tail You'll see those fish way up on the inside. Um, the clam lease poles, the mm -hmm. crab pots that are way up on the inside. And when they're here, it's kind of, when they're migrating through Christian River, it's a mixed bag. Every year, there are different sections that are better than others. Um, I run lines of buoys straight out, and I'll run them for 10 miles. And once you find that zone that they're kind of hanging in, that's when you stay there. But in the summer months up north of here, they'll be way inshore. And I've seen them in the summertime here way in short but not the numbers that you want to actually go target them um, it's very hit or miss that time of year yeah it's almost like you you got to run into it all right a fly question so jc and adam are going to be up on this one um you can only take three flies with you to fish tomorrow what are they adam that's tough um here i fish a lot of bait fish patterns mm -hmm because it's easier to keep them off the rocks. Off the bottom, yeah, suspending. Um, I have a shrimp, I have some here, I'll show you guys. I have a shrimp that I tie that's really effective for this area. It's not weighted, mm -hmm. but it absorbs enough water to where it does have a pretty good sink rate. So I would say a natural colored tan bait fish fly, one of those shrimp flies, and I always have to have a gurgler with me. Okay, because a, that makes it fun. A gurgler is my go-to for tailing right and for those of you that don't know what a gurgler is, the, the artificial and natural bait guys, that's more or less the top water version of a popper, almost like a popper fly. JC, what would you what would you take if someone's gonna go out tomorrow on three flies? I'm gonna be pretty close to them. I have a small shrimp pattern that's real lightweight but more natural color. Mm -hmm. And then I have uh, a gurgler, of course, just you know, we all have to. You all we, all, we all want that top water fly. Yeah, to push. Uh, I have a couple natural bait fish patterns that I would throw for structure, small target and stuff like that. Gotcha. All right, here's one that everyone wants to know in this area. If you encounter lots of floating dead grass on the surface, how do you adjust your fishing to fish around that stuff? James? Well, it just depends on, I mean, 
during the summertime, you know, we get a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to do artificial anywhere out there, you might as well just uh, just give it up. So if you're going to do artificial, you just go east to get yeah. away from it. Yep. I mean, get in the creeks. And by, right now, all the flooding grass has started. It's pretty much gone from what I can tell. Yeah. So, you know, it just, you got to just, like this time of year, you can pretty much do artificial everywhere. Yeah. You know? So, like I said, when it's bad in the summer, if I have somebody that wants to do artificial, I just go in the back. And that's how but, I, but would you just natural bait fish? So in the dead grass, if you got lots of floating dead grass, can you just natural bait fish with it? No. Yeah, I mean, I'll have on the outside, on the, on the outside keys, I don't have problems with it. If it is bad, I mean, if I'm doing like, you know, if I was in a live bait, like a pinfish, I can take a jig head and just put it on a pinfish and just End of problem. send it out there and it gets below it. Yeah. You know? um, so that and then free line, you know, free line works, but if, if the grass is bad, Line can be tough as well, so I'll just go to a jig head if I have to. Or you, anything that gets it down below it, you know. Dallas, what do you say? I like it, um, adds a little extra challenge to everything. Um, just like James said, uh, put some weight on there, get, get beneath it. Um, again, I kind of talked a little bit about it on a previous question, but shade. <clears throat> Especially mm -hmm. that July time of year, grass is shed and it's pushed up. I look for little choke points on an island where tide will flow through it in a certain way, and you'll end up with this big mat of grass that's now creating more shade and more cover that is we'll comes call further, off the, further off the mangrove. Further off line. the mangrove, and if you can get a bait under there, uh, that's awesome. A live bait, you can kind of learn how to steer under it. You know, uh, if you tail hook them, you can almost with no weight get them to to swim under it just a foot or so, and that's that deadly. Um, or again, a big old old school flipping stick and get you a heavy weight, get them in there. Oh, this is going to be controversial, so naturally I'm going to pick Jeremiah to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> if you had the chance to make one fishing rule or law, what would it be? You can't have everyone leave the county, sure. No, just, uh, that's hard. Oh, man. Hard. No, <laughs> one rule or one law. You want to change so many, you can't even pick one. Nice. Screw the airbags out of the creek. That's the most annoying. Five minutes we're sitting there talking to somebody. You got a lot of people nodding their head on that one, so you probably you probably won one more there. So I, I got some other stuff too. Yeah. I got some, you some butt butt on too. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sock, what do you say? I'm thinking about getting an airboat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> better stay out of arms reach, Jeremiah. <laughs> I like the airboats. I just don't like the ones like. I just don't like a way people run them. No, they're they're obnoxious, and you know, I had a guy, I had an airboat last week. I was on a charter in a little tiny creek, and here he comes, and there was two ways out, and he he just had to come by me, and it just would, you know, my customers were like, "What is this guy doing?" Yeah. But uh, I don't know. There, it, it, most of it, you could you could own an airboat and not be an a hole. <laughs> yeah. You sure? Now, when I call these guys professionals, I meant that in a very loose manner. <laughs> All right, here, here's a good question, and I get asked this one a lot online. Um, how do you guys maintain your tackle, your rod and reels, so that it stays in good shape year round? Is there a trick to that, James? Um, I, I cycle my reels out a lot. I can drop them off. I get them serviced, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I drop them off here at Sodium. Um, I'm, I spray. I Once a week, I wipe all my rods down, and then I usually use them for about six months, like maybe a year, and then I'll, I'll replace them all, you know. So and some reels I've had my whole stuff in guiding, so just, you know, just keeping them clean. And I like using that... Uh, the reels oil or the uh, real magic. The, I use I use real magic. That does help, especially spray. You're, th you're thinking of cleanse oil. Cleanse oil. Yeah, that's I, a veteran-owned business. There. I that's, like I like I like that for knives, for guns, for I like, everything. I like that. I'll you know I'll drop some in my reel, and I also use every day before I start my trip. I take real magic and I spray my spools for my braid. Yeah. I think it does help with uh, the longevity, especially for us that are you know keeps it slick. Keeps yeah. it slick. Casting. 
especially if you're fishing, you know, 20, 25 days a month, you know, um, it's a break every time that does get expensive, you know, so the longer you can get out of it, the better, you know. Brandon? Um, I run really high-end reels that last a long time, but now with the Daiwas, and I don't know if Shimano does this or not, but Daiwa, on their high-end stuff, they give you three years or five years, depending on which reel it is. You can send it to them as many times as you want. Yeah. Send it to California. Yes. They will go through the whole entire reel. <coughs> Anything that's broke, fix it for free. Yeah. So spending the money on a good reel um, that you're able to do that with is very important. Okay. I send my grouper stuff off twice a year, send it to them. They go through it. I actually was at the Daiwa factory a couple weeks ago, and I saw the guys in the back. Um, they have a team that is just doing that, going through reels and just oiling them, greasing them, making sure everything's working. So, yes, you're spending a lot of money, but you're going to get more time out of that reel because you're able to do these things with it. That was a good answer. Um, all right, here's one that I can help out with. Is Ned Rig fishing productive in this area? Is it a technique you use regularly or just seasonally, Adam? I don't do it a lot, but I do use it in the winter when I am. Um, if I have people that want to sight fish on spin gear instead of fly, mm -hmm. I will use Ned Rigs as a light presentation with the, the little craw baits. That's right. And uh, it's a really good option. It's, an, it's a good alternative to fly fishing to be able to sight fish. Yeah, with that rig. Sock, do you ever do that? Uh, I have in the winter time back in the creeks, sight fishing. Mm -hmm. Any type of uh, small profile. Yeah. If you're sight fishing. Bucktail, bucktail jigs, anything your, like that. Your bugs jig. Yeah, the bugs jig. Yeah. The small one for for sight fishing. Uh, but I haven't gotten to a ton of the Ned stuff. But you know, anything smaller profile when you're sight fishing. Any time of year, I think is the deal. Do you got, do you guys know what the Ned rig is? It's an old Midwestern bass technique that's become very popular in saltwater, and it is. It's just basically smaller baits that are on super light jig heads, super super light jig heads, and you're a, you're able to throw close to the target fish, especially sight fishing, and catch them. It's it's super effective for me. It's like what I prefer to do. Um, see what else we got here. Here's one. Are there bait migrations or hatches on the nature coast that make for an incredible bite? Like, it's like, just like the mullet run is on the other side. If, do we have a hatch or a migration <coughs> similar to that? Jeremiah. Uh, usually, I usually October is one of the last minutes, tons of them. They're out. We go out of the need of ladyfish, mm -hmm. you know, mackerel, bluefish, all kind of chase them. Pretty big old schools of fish, um, from like Gomez Rocks out just west of the school of Banks here. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun to do. It's just something extra to go have fun with. Yeah, well, that's one of my questions later on is about Spanish macro because that's something that I like to do too. The find is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and we might have a shrimp migration. I mean, just north of here, Cedar Key, they see an ash and kill them shrimp. And I just don't think that was really messing with it, so we don't want to make up. Brandon, you got anything to add? I saw the shrimp migration last month um, on the east-west line between Cedar Key and Wakasasa, mm -hmm. um, and you could definitely tell that the fish were honing in on that shrimp run. Just the amount of blow-ups and the white birds, I've never seen so many white birds in my whole entire life, just for miles, it was solid white birds. And they're, the mud banks where a lot of times in the summertime, there's not a lot of fish. They're not there looking for the current, but the still mud banks where those shrimp were is where we were finding a lot of our fish. I had the best day of fly fishing I've ever had um, four weeks ago with Captain Trey Michael up in Wakasasa, and it was solely because of those shrimp, in my yeah. opinion. I mean, every fish you saw was tailing up on the bank pushing. You could throw to them, and they'd bite every time yeah. um, that shrimp had it. But tuned into it. I talked to a lot of the guys up in Cedar Key this year that were catching those shrimp with gas nets and using them for bait, and they, they were really big shrimp, and they were following those shrimp um, down from Swanee, and they said the fish were with them. So you, you, do you guys like this style that we're doing where these guys are answering these questions? You're getting some information that some of you wouldn't think to ask, you know what I mean? And it's controlled. 
I don't have Jeremiah talking about his grandfather or anything like that. I don't have James telling stories about the Middle East. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know you could. Um, here we go. What's the primo water temp pros in the spring and fall that really jump starts to bite? I mean, where everything starts to chew. James. Um, you know, I'd say, well, the spring. That spring or fall. That, that 68 to, to 72 degree. Um, like the past few weeks, I really noticed, it, especially after you know, when the storm came in, the water temperature was probably... Um, in the low 80s, and yeah. it just dropped down to like it dropped down to like 71, and it, the bite was just absolutely off the chain, incredible. I yeah. mean, the fish were everywhere; they were eating. You could catch them, and you know, I mean, so that that 68 to 72, I think here is like uh, optimal for catching everything, especially for the inshore species. Yeah, um, I think it that, that, that's what you want right there. JC, same, same, 72 range. 72 is good. That's where it's at right now. And we're in here. <laughs> <laughs> Disaster relief. Disaster relief. <laughs> it's nice outside. That's true. And and a lot of you guys, if you if you got paper and pencil or notes in your phone, you can take notes on this stuff because this stuff it, it's a big help. Trust me, I'm writing stuff down. All right, let's go back to that Spanish mackerel. Spanish mackerel are a seasonal target in most areas. Is there a month or season on the nature coast? And what bait, natural bait, or artificial is the most effective on it? Jeremiah, since you were, you were in that way, what do you think? Probably like everything else, about March, April. Um, a lot of people sit there and chum for them on a free line. That's how it was clear. Like shrimp is kind of floating. Um, obviously anything. Flashy yeah. for an artificial with spoons. You get no busting. Clark spoons, the old Clark spoons, you know, stuff uh, like that. Triple herring spoon. Jigs. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in a free, they're just like jacks when you're in a frenzy of them. Then you just go to a bear hill cabin. Yeah. What do you think, Dallas? Uh, I love doing it. Yeah. I love eating them. Is there a month, is there a month though? or? Yeah. Um, I, I find them a lot in May. Uh, go out to where the water's a little dirtier. I get bored in May. Uh, snook season's over. I'm sad, so I go do something <laughs> fun. Go, um, go really chase down the, the Spanish mackerel. Customers love it. Uh, I find a jig with the longest shank hook I can find on it, an eighth or a quarter. And just get as much dead shrimp or chum out there as you can. And I spot lock it. And just chum it up. Mm -hmm. Find your rock pile or a uh, nice big flat area near the spoil banks. Anywhere like that, you can chum them up, and uh, you know, days you catch 20 or 30 of them. And oh, they're, yeah. they're all giants. Uh, but that long shank jig head uh, helps, helps keep the cutoffs. Yeah, yeah, keep the cutoffs. You can get those pre made leaders, the wire leaders. I, I'll do that sometimes if they're really active and breaking us off. Uh, just, little, just need a little wire. Uh, handle them carefully because they will cut you. All right. Pros, do you have a game plan for fishing every day, or do you adapt to variables as you see them throughout the day? Sock? Yeah, I, I do. You know, sometimes it keeps me up at night just thinking about what, what am I going to do the next day, you know, how things are going to play out. But then, I, you know, I try and think up a game plan, but then I go out the next day, and conditions are a little different, and I just go off and do something completely different, which is what I did yesterday. Uh, I made up a game plan, but conditions were a little different. The tide, you know, is a little higher than I thought. And I went to a completely different area, and we caught a ton of it, you know, nice snow. Mm -hmm. So it just, you know, I always have a game plan, but sometimes it, it Changes, yep. you know, when you get out there. Adam, same question. I have a game plan when I hit the water every day, and I don't think I've ever stuck to my game plan. <laughs> 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 the wind is never what it's supposed to be. The tide is never what it's supposed to be. And a lot of time I'll be running from the ramp to my first spot, and I'll see something that will that make I, you stop. That'll make me stop and go check it out and. 
like sock, I lay in bed and I think about every single thing I'm going to do the next day. And by the time I get to the rim, it's all gone. Like uh, I, I start from scratch and just kind of take it as I, as we go. You guys ever heard of Adderall? <laughs> <laughs> all right. How do the snook in this region survive the hard freezes? JC. Moving back into the river, getting up to the next spring water. That's, that's all, the secret. They all migrate back in there. Brandon, do they go offshore at all? or? Not in the wintertime. I have not seen very many fish offshore, and I spend a lot of time out there. I think, for the most part, they're moving into the rivers, um, to the springs, to the back. Maybe not even the springs, but way back in the creeks and the deeper holes, way into the east, uh, where you're going to find that warmer water in the mud. Uh, back in Ozello, way back in Chazawitska, just deep in the creeks back there where that water is staying a little bit warmer. Um, that is where you'll find some of your fish kills if we get a really hard freeze. But a lot of those fish are going back there trying to get away from it. Yeah, going as far back as they can. All right. Here's, here's a question I get all the time, too. Pros, when a pod of dolphins are present, does it totally shut down the fishing? James. I, when I'm red fishing, I mean, a lot of guys say, oh, man, we got a lot of times, I'll be, I'll be out there fishing, you know, and I'll pay attention to the dolphins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're chasing them all, but they're also chasing, you know, redfish. Yeah. So a lot of times what I do is I'll go, I'll give it a couple minutes, and even if they sit right in front of me and destroy everything, I won't leave all this set there. Or if they're across the way or whatever, I'll go over there and I'll fish it because what happens when those dolphins come in, I think, and I might be wrong, but it's, it's I've caught some of my biggest redfish doing this. They go in there, they kill things, they, they stir up the water, um, there's injured bait fish, sometimes injured mullet, and those redfish, you know, they're only doing a few things all day. Surviving is one of them, yes, but they're also trying to eat. So I think they know that when everything is stirred up like that, they'll go behind and clean up. You know, they see the opportunity. The opportunity. They could yeah. be shrimp. They can stir up little, all the crustaceans. Little, you know, I mean, but some people they see dolphins, they're gone. I use it uh, as an advantage um, sometimes. You know, it just depends. Jeremiah, what do you think? I like it. You like it? I mean, I've been sitting on a place like James said, sitting there and watching fish going around, and porpoise come through, and all of a sudden they just turn on. I mean, honestly, yeah, sometimes I don't want to see them, but. I mean, I'm going to them all the they round them up right there, and I get in there with them. The times when you don't want to see them is when you're looking at redfish. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you got like 50 right there, and they just come right through them, and like, dang it, you know? <laughs> uh, all right, let's jump to cobia. Cobia are targets that can be found where and what time of year is the best time of year. JC. That's springtime when they start migrating through here, uh, March and April. March and April? Yeah, offshore a little ways. Sock, what, what do you think? I used to catch a lot of them offshore grouper fishing 40, 50 miles out. That's where, you know, I would say majority of our cobia are going to come through on that near shore to offshore range. But we do have a lot of them that I've caught in the last few years up to like 53 inches in the backcountry. So, you know, they're a roamer. They're a roaming fish. So you'll get a strong incoming tide and they'll just follow that tide in mm -hmm. and they'll end up back by the Salt River Bridge and, you know, way back. Where you don't expect where them. Where you don't expect them. Uh, but a lot of big ones near shore. Staying on that same subject, cobia baits, natural and artificial. Brandon? It all depends on where I'm at. Uh, I always have a big uh, jerk bait rigged up, something long, like an eel style bait. I did really well on the new Z Man Hercules swim bait, the mm -hmm. bigger one this year. Uh, that was a very good bait for me. Other than that, live pinfish, a hook in the back is where they're really erratic. Um, or like a live threadfin herring for the cobias is one of my favorite baits on the big ledges, big rock piles, big structure. Um, a lot of people will sit and jump for cobia. I don't really have the patience. I like to move around. So I am moving different zones. And as you're moving to different rock piles and stuff, you can run these grass lines that we have that time of year. 
um, and be able to throw that artificial when they're on the surface, and that's right. kind of my favorite thing to do. But I move around a lot. I look for the grass. I run those grass lines, and that's when you're going to get your best shot with those jerk baits and your Hercules swim baits or your DOA bait busters. Jeremiah, um, show me a bait, natural baits and artificials. Like Brandon said, swim baits, um, thin fish. Um, sometimes when you don't have nothing, you got a little catch up for the boss. But <coughs> okay, if you're swimming around trying to eat her, won't eat nothing, you put that little catfish on and they love them. So I always try to keep a little catfish with me. Only you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one's got a little levity in it. So, most valuable accessory on your vessel, and I'm not talking about the drink holder. <laughs> Adam. Sunglasses. Sunglasses. Okay. Are you looking for something more boat specific? More boat specific, but for me, it would be boat specific. Would be my push pole. Push pole. Dallas. That trolling motor, I guess. I'm, I'm Having a good trolling motor that works, got plenty of juice for your boats, matched to the boat, gets you around quiet. Uh, you know, I, I don't fly fish, so I don't need to push pull and, and be quiet, but if you're in a small vessel, quieter you are, the, the better, for sure, especially after tarping and the stuff you guys do down there. Uh, definitely a trolling motor with spot lock, because if your power pole goes out, you got spot lock. <laughs> I would say the same thing with the... Uh, uh, a trolling motor. I mean, for boat specific, I will say for fishing, my boomerang. Um, I know that's uh, <laughs> personal, personal accessory. Yeah. Personal accessory when I'm cutting knots and all that. But for the boat, I mean, um, Trent, I don't know. Probably, probably the trolling motor. I use, I use those. I use that thing a lot. I'm gonna get one more sock. What would you say? Yeah, I. It would be very hard for me to operate every day without a trolling motor. I have three nice trolling motors, you know, because they break and, you know, I run them up on rocks. I use them for, I have to chase down mullet and other bait fish. Oh, I've seen, I've seen you in action. So, I've seen you. I know without that doing. trolling motor, I'd have to have Donnie drive the boat. Uh, and I, I'd, I would say the two most destructive people on equipment that are good testers would be Jeremiah and Son. I'm surprised you didn't pick a waffle iron, though, for your favorite vessel exam. Do you guys know why we call him Captain Waffles? He'll take buttered waffles out of his house when you meet him there, and he'll squirt syrup on them, and he sets them on the helm of his boat while we're running around. He's eating them off out of his hand on there like they're sandwiches. And I don't know what's been on the top of that helm, but there's nothing going to get through his intestinal tract that's going to kill him. <laughs> uh, all right, here's a good question. Do fish get trapped in the creeks during the extreme low tides? JC. Yeah. They do get trapped in there. So they don't all come out. They don't all come out. And I like fishing them. On those extreme low tides, I run a mud boat. I get back in there when everything's dry. Mm -hmm. And you just wait for the tide to come back and get you out at the end. Yeah. I tried a little bit of that this year. It was fun. Yeah. Until the tide doesn't come back till the end of the evening, oh, and then the no seams are not fun. <laughs> you gotta watch. You gotta watch your tide very carefully. Yeah. Hey guys, Dallas, you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, they get trapped back there. It's awesome. You get. Uh, Learn your boat, and uh, now you go up north, people have, will leave their boat tied up, hop off, and, and walk to get to the fish that are trapped. And it, you know, the, the term fishing in a barrel, that's real. That happens out here. On, on those good days where those fish are fired up, it is one of the most fun, incredible bites to just sit there and just a, a 30 foot round hole that's three foot deep, you can see them, and it, it, it's incredible. Um, so yeah, they definitely get trapped in there. It's dangerous getting to them, and like he said, make sure you have some bucks break. No <laughs> Sam's back here will carry you off. Yeah, in Yankee, in Yankee Town, I, I, you almost have to bring an extra bag of plasma with you, honestly. <laughs> it doesn't even matter if you have bug dope and you're all covered up. They still, somehow they'll crawl through the hat. They're tough. Um, how long do you work an artificial lure before you decide to make a change? 
Um, and do you make the change from pro, pro in profile or in color or bold, Adam? I'll work a artificial bait or a fly probably a lot longer than I should because I change the presentation style a lot more before I change the bait. So, the so if I'm moving it fast, I'll slow down. If I'm moving it slow, I'll speed up. I'll, I'll twitch it more. I won't twitch it. So I'll go through a, I'll go through the gamut of ways to fish the bait mm -hmm. before I actually change switch. the because everybody everybody's guilty of this. I'm guilty of it. Everybody has the baits that they're confident in. Right. When you're fishing your confidence bait, you don't want to switch it until you know that right. you're wrong. Right. I get it. I get it. I'm guilty of that as well. Brandon. I watch how the fish are reacting to whatever I'm throwing. Um, if the fish are spooky, if they're reacting very aggressively mm -hmm. to what I'm going to do, um, the size, the profile, either I'm going to throw something smaller or I'm going to throw something big. Like Adam said, I have realistically in my tackle box seven different baits, that, various colors, which yeah. I will change depending on the water color, the, right. the which light. weight. Um, but yeah, I mean, I pick my seven confidence baits. That's what I have in my tackle box, and that's what I fish with. Period. But if the fish are being really spooky, I'll go really small. I throw the Ned rig a lot. Um, I throw really the Z-Man shrimp, the little shrimp on a really light jig head a lot. Or if they're really aggressive that day, it's overcast. They're wanting to bite. I'll throw something fast moving. Or mm -hmm. you just have to. I watch how the fish are reacting to what I'm throwing before I make that change. Okay. Good. That's good intel right there. I mean, because that's that's a question that gets asked a lot. Can you cast net bait in the Nature Coast zone without tearing the net to pieces? Or do you rely on pinfish traps and sabiki rigs? I'm going to ask Sock this question because I know he likes so to tear I, stuff up. I have a good uh, relationship with the wholesale cast nets, Brad. Well, that answered that question. <laughs> no, 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 I, I get new nets like. You know, sometimes, but I, I also repair my nets and try and make them last. Uh, but I I use pinfish traps to get my pinfish. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I do sabikium to get the larger pins. If I want the big pinfish, yeah. they won't fit in the trap. Right. So I'll sabikium with some squid and get some really big pins. Uh, but I, all of the above. But you're going to lose cast nets here. <laughs> that's for sure, because that's where the bait lives. Jeremiah, with your commercial fishing background, i got to ask you the same question. What do you say? Uh, yeah, you can, especially when, <clears throat> when you see a pile of up on rocks and the tire sitting there watching over you. You know, you shouldn't have done it, but you did it anyways. So <laughs> you try to get your <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's a fun one, just because uh, I get I get uh, people will bring stuff on my boat all the time. Favorite boat snack, food, whatever that is just kind of always a standard, like the benchmark on your boat, Dallas. So I had an old timer come on the boat, and he had Vienna sausages and Bud Light. <laughs> and, uh, I don't condone I'm cramps right here. Right now. <laughs> too much on your boat, but I tell you what, a can of Viennas and one Bud Light was just one of the best lunches on the boat I've ever had. And you never have to worry about them going bad either. So nothing's gonna sting. The cans. Adam goes. You gotta worry about them going bad because they already are. <laughs> I'm serious, man. That that was good stuff. Well, Adam, you just volunteered yourself to answer the same question now. The only thing I ever eat on the boat is beef jerky. Beef jerky. Beef jerky. JC. Pickles. Pickles. Cheez-Its are good, too. Cheez-Its are good? <laughs> Brandon? <laughs> Probably beef jerky. I don't eat much of this, too. Yeah, you're too busy focused on yeah. fishing. I already know socks is waffles, so I don't even have to ask that. <laughs> Jeremiah? And you can't, and you can't, you can't say energy drinks. I was gonna say Copenhagen. Copenhagen. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't I believe you do eat that. <laughs> but yeah, feature you probably. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Uh,
dark 30 in the morning has always been the rule to take advantage of the early bite. But what about months like January, February, and March? What's your preferred launch time, Adam? I usually go out 8, 8.30 that time of year because I, I don't want to fish until the sun's up. If it's cold, I want the sun to be up. For sight fishing, you have to have the sun up anyway, so I don't do a lot of dark 30 trips. Cause, I mean, I will certain times of the year if we're going to throw top water in the morning, <laughs> but 8, 8.30 is usually my standard. All right, Night Stalker, I know I know what your answer is going to be, James. Um, that time of year, I mean, in the summertime, yeah, I'll leave early all the time. But that time of year, um, January, February, I usually wait for the tide to come in. You know, if it's later in the day especially, like, but that time I'm doing a lot of trout fishing. So, um, you know, even if the tide starts coming at 9 o'clock, I won't leave till noon, 1 o'clock. Just let it get in, let the water get in, because those fish are going to move up on all the hard bottom, uh, especially the trout. Yeah. You know, to get warm. So I'll I'll wait. You know, and I don't care if I'm fishing at four or five o'clock, but it, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be warmer. And the and the and the bite typically in those months is is later in the day anyway when yes. the fish really start because they're cold blooded. So they've got to get the the water temperature once it has enough radiation and it, it gets them kicked off. Um, you'll see everything get more active later in the day. All right. Um, let's see. Bottom makeup is important here on the Nature Coast. What types of cover hold speckled trout, snook, reds, and even grouper? Brandon. The hard bottom, the rocks. Um, year round, you're going to find your fish on the rocks. In ledges for the grouper, any kind of wrecks for the grouper, but that hard rock bottom, uh, the light colored especially for the, the trout. The gold right? stuff. The golden bottom is what we call it. Uh, that's what we're focusing on most of the time is that golden light colored bottom. Yeah. I was riding around when I was here full time all the time instead of migrating from Tampa Bay and fishing up here out of Chaz where all the bottom is gold. And I rode around with Jeremiah one day and he goes, you see all these gold spots? Don't go near them. And I'm thinking, they're, how do you not run near them? <laughs> they're everywhere. Um, Jeremiah, anything to add to that? Um, the kelp grass. You know, it's the gonna, kelp grass. That's what I was looking for, too. too yeah. Like Brandon said, the gold bottom, he could be drifting off for trout, and all of a sudden, hook into a grouper because he's got a hole 20 feet away. You know, just we, we pull a lot of creek mouths and things that will have mm -hmm. that long kelp grass that will lean over. And the fish sometimes get in behind it almost as a current break, like it's a rock. And you'll see redfish coming in and out of it. You always see snook down inside of it. It's always a challenge to be able to fish that stuff and not, you know, get hung up. Can't really fish it with, with hard, with hard bait as much as you can with jigs. But it is, it's a lot of fun. We catch a lot of fish. Um, are there big redfish schools? I'm talking schools that are over 50, 100 fish in a school that appear on the Nature Coast on what time of year, James? Yes. Yes. Um, I've been on multiple schools the past few weeks where, you know, I have 100, 150 fish. Literally, you catch one and 25 come with it. Yeah. And I'll have, I always have an extra bait ready. So as soon as I see those fish, I tell my clients to catch in there and they hook up right away. So there's, you know, right now they're everywhere. And that, I think after the storm, it definitely uh, it pushed in a lot of fish. Because um, we have that super high or the super low and now they're coming I don't know it was just like overnight like they might have just been late this year too yeah you know it seemed like this year was one of those years where everything was uh, either a couple of weeks or a month behind okay. uh, but yeah I mean there's been multiple schools out there on the outside area you got to find them yeah you know but once you find them there can be a hundred two hundred fish in one school and they're all Upper slot, over slot fish. I mean, you're getting 35 inches, 36 inches. Um, it's it's really a, a good time right now to be fishing out there for redfish. You gotta find them though. Sock, big schools. Or? You know, it contradictory to what James just said. I've seen less and less schools showing up over the last five, three, four years. You know. Uh, Last year and the year before, I had one big school show up. They were there for a few days. and that, But the, the traditional spots that always held schools of reds, end of August, 
through September, mm -hmm. and they're just not there. And there's been a couple schools. I know where James has been fishing, that area. There's been a couple schools down that way, but I've seen a lot less redfish in, in big wads, like, you know, 100 or more. Uh, and I don't know. You know, every year's a little different. Yeah. But I've seen it decline. Okay. That's good to know. It's yeah. good to know that. Because um, you guys are on the water a lot, both of you. All right, the, this question is going to be for JC and for Adam. If you want to get into fly fishing, what's a good beginner setup, if you will, for reds, trout, snow here on the Nature Coast? JC first. I'd say an eight weight, something reliable, and I mean, you ain't got to spend a ton of money on something. What's a what's a ton of money? What's reliable and affordable versus a ton of money? Probably. You get away for it like 500 bucks. With 500 bucks. Set up, rod, reel, line, everything. <laughs> but a good eight weight. I mean, you can handle redfish and trout all day. You can you can fight some smoke. Just depends on how big the one you hook into. Adam, I agree. Eight weight is the best all around fly rod. If you're gonna have one, it's gotta be an eight weight for right here. Really, for anywhere in, in the state of Florida. Um, price. Yeah. Depending on brand, and I'll leave the brands out of it, but you can get a good starter set for three to five hundred. The the line is more important than the reel when you're starting out because a lot of the cheaper combos come with a crappy line. It's it's garbage. It, it doesn't have any weight to it. It doesn't have any taper to it. It's just a universal crappy line. If you try learning with a cheap line, you're going to be really frustrated because unlike the weight of a jig head when you cast that cast a spin rod, mm -hmm. it's the line on the fly rod that casts your fly. That's right. So the line is probably one of the most important pieces of the whole puzzle. So are you better off guys with a shorter head, like Rio makes that redfish line that has the shorter head so it's easier to make those quick short casts, or are you better with like a bonefish taper which has a longer head and it's easier to carry line and it's a little bit smoother? Well, what I, would a beginner be better with? A beginner would be better with a heavier taper, a heavier front loaded taper like your redfish tapers and stuff like that. Yeah. Or a just, quick shooter. Yeah, you know, just because like that bonefish line it being so long it takes that much line for it to get going before. Right. So if you're new to it, the shorter amount of line that you need out is the better. What's the average shot here with you, you two guys as far as when you pull up and they're and they're getting a shot at, with fly because it's obviously a lot different. They've got to be able to see the head of the fish. Fly fishing is is a lot tougher than uh, than just plug fishing or anything like that because you you've got to deliver the fly something very small to a to a small zone. I'd say thirty to fifty. 30 to 50 feet. Realistically. So right in the middle. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. And that's close. I mean, yeah. accuracy. Fly 13 casting. yards for you math wizards. Yeah. <laughs> the, the accuracy is far more important than distance when you're, when when you're fly. Fishing. You have to be able to get that 40 or 50 feet. Yeah. But the accuracy is everything. Okay. Um, let's see here. Here's a good question, and, and it's kind of been danced around a little bit. Most anglers like to concentrate their cast to mangrove edges and points. That's how our brain works. Um, when do you target the open water potholes or rocks? And I'm asking that to the pros as far as tide height, you know, low or high, or is there a season when it's colder or they have pulled away from it or not? Or are they is it always the case? So I'm going to let Brandon answer that one kind of again. Year round, I target off the bank. Um, I think those fish bite pretty decent, and I just I fish all the zones basically, and I tell my clients to fish all the from out in the middle to inshore. Um, it just all depends on where the fish are wanting, what they're keying in on, and things like that. But I year round, I fish a lot of times off, off the, the bank. bank, and I think. That, some of that might have to do with the pressure of people fishing them on the bank all the time. It's pushing the fish. I, I pulled up to a spot the other day, a guy that had just got done fishing it, and he's casting to the bushes while the fish were behind his boat the whole entire time, which he could have gotten too close to them, and they just looped right back around right, him. Yeah. But 
Um, I think that might have to do with some of the pressure and people running the banks uh, really close and just pushing those fish off. But I do a lot of fishing way off the bank. Dallas, I know you like fish in the bank. I like fish in the bank, and he's right. You will push fish away. If you spook a school, you get too close, they're, they're going to push off. So, so Brandon's definitely spot on with that pressure. Um, you asked about tide heights. Um, obviously, if it's low tide, I go to mud boat mentality, even when it's not mud boat season, and fish those bigger, deeper pockets on the outside of the islands, away from the mangroves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was last month sometime. Uh, I ran over a hole I've never seen before and must have driven over it, you know, a thousand times. And better, I'm like, better a hole than a rock. Yeah, and I'm like, that's interesting. <laughs> Super low tide, stop the boat, push it over there, and we caught, uh, I think, three snook and a couple reds out of it. And I'm like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So you just never know. But uh, but definitely, definitely both tactics work, and you definitely need to uh, explore both. I'm going to ask James the same question just because it's one of those questions that this everyone asks. I mean, I'm the same way. All, it all depends on the tide. A lot of times, like especially with our outside area, there's a lot of pressure out there. Um, on low tide, a lot of times I like to set up and stage, you know, and wait for the tide to come to me because, you know, you, got, you know where the fish are going to come in. And on high tide, a lot of times if I'm fishing on the outside. I can go to pretty much any, well, I can go to any of the keys out there, and I always find my redfish. I've found them for about 200 yards off of a key. Uh, they'll, there'll be boats, there'll be two boats on the key, and I'll come in from way out, the way outside, and I'm far away from them. I'm like, there's a redfish right there. Yeah. And they're just balled up right there. But you gotta know what to look for. You know, um, there's a couple things, and not all the time does it work. I call it little, the little bait flicking. I feel yeah. well, it's nice. You know, but it's, it's not the finger moves. But uh, the bait flicking, um, the mullet, mullet's knives. I like to look for the mullet that are out there. They're rolling around. They're flashing yeah. underneath, and they're not jumping. Because usually they're they're kind of held up right there. So um, I do. I fish the shore too, but the, on the high tide, I like fishing off the keys, way off of them. Booger Woods fishing. You know, Jeremiah, I'm gonna call on you for this. What does that really entail, and how far back do the fish actually go? Will they go halfway back, or do they go all the way to the back? Uh, they'll go all the way to the back, you know. <clears throat> Just when you take dead ends, you know, a lot of stuff I like to keep going. And even in the summertime, you know, these fish will drop out <clears throat> kind of to the mouth of the creeks. And there's places where you can't get no more. And I've watched them, especially during the scallop season. As soon as that tide will come in, these fish look like salmon go to the water and they split off into those bushes. But I, yeah, I think they go back there not all the time, for <coughs> quarter months, for mm -hmm. sure. And a lot of it's to get away from the pressure. I mean, it's, there's all kinds of potholes, there's all kinds of rock stuff back there, and the bullet, everything goes back there. Sock, same question. Because I've caught you back there before. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do a lot of fishing back there. Uh, it just, what was the. You asked about the. What does that really entail? What what would, if these folks Booger don't know what fishing. Booger Wood fishing is? It's really just getting, picking a creek or a little mangrove, whatever, and just following it until it peters out. Yeah, to the to the end, and you know, exploring. A lot of our stuff connects to each other. Yeah. So if you make a, a turn here, you've never been down. I mean, it could take you to a whole nother. Yeah, because I go down them, I don't know, pardon the expression, crap from apple butter, and I'm, I'm like, well, the water still moves. I'll just go down this one. I'll come out in some place I've never even been, and it's out the mouth of another creek where it just horseshoes around. And it all connects. Yeah. But pretty much the is just going to and having fun. Yeah. It's still trying to fish. It is buggy. It is very buggy. All right, let's see what else. Black drum are an unheralded game fish in many areas, but here anglers like catching them. What artificials or flies work best? I'm going to let uh, Dallas you answer it first. Do you even target these guys? Yeah, I actually just found a school um, last week, and they're awesome. Sight fishing a lot of times. Um, I know the question was. For artificial and flies and whatnot. Tell us the natural um, If you find them, blue crab 
it's a little little secret, man. It's money. It's money. I I get up. I go up to Charlie's. I say, hey, I need a dozen of your smallest bluegrass. They give them to you. I cut them in half, big pair of shears, put them uh, right in the paddle pin, and drop them down. Uh, normally, I like to put an eighth ounce or a quarter ounce jig head on it, with uh, at least a three odd hook jig head. Um, I have had success throwing gold baits. Um, it, it's got to be something soft, something stinky. Yeah. If you're throwing uh, artificial form, and and they are just so much fun. We don't eat them. Uh, those are breeder fish when you get get those those big ones. And uh, uh, I think that's actually the profile picture is a 14 year old with a 42 incher on my my uh, Facebook page because they're just big, fun, that's a for, big, that's especially attractive. for younger kids. KC, I know you fly fish and you could catch them on fly too, but if you're going to throw artificials or fly, what would you throw? I was going to just pick between the two. Yeah. I mean, I, like you said, gold. I used to throw a lot of gold shrimp on a big dead stick and just leave it sitting there. They'll just come get it. They'll just come get it. Adam, Adam was a camera boat for me one time, and we were fishing with Bernie Schultz. I don't know how many of you guys know Bernie. Bernie's a unbelievable bass angler and an antique lure connector among other things but uh bernie and i were out there and we would see these black drum on these reefs out of yankee town and we were taking miradines and you'd see one and he'd be up on a reef and you'd swing like a 27 mr like a big old heart bait and you'd throw it it looked like a pinfish landing in front of him and you'd kick it three times real hard where it flashed like that and his head would come up and then you just start reeling away and he'd come all the way to the surface and you'd see his head come out of the water and go, poof, just eat it right off the surface. It was just a matter of getting their attention uh, to catch them on that. And I don't know why we kept doing it. It's not like the sexiest fish in the world to catch. But the way we were doing it, you could see it all, and the drone could see it all. It was just a lot of fun. All right. Uh, talking about different species, let's talk about sheep's head, or popular target for winter and early spring fishing trips. What's the best way to have success with sheep's head? James. Um, I really don't do a lot, but the guys that do, they usually go out in um, on the shallow water rocks um, in that uh, in the cooler months, February, mm -hmm. uh, March. I've done a little bit of it, but anywhere you know in the shallow water rocks, and I'm sure the boys they can get them in deep water as well. Um, and you do catch them on the inside from time to time. But it's more of a uh, for me, it's more of a, uh, a fish, of, fish of opportunity, a by catch. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. um, really target and target. Jeremiah? Uh, my favorite month is November. Catching them in real shallow and potholes and before they even really get offshore. They're usually a lot bigger. And obviously, offshore, there's some big ones, but November is probably my favorite month. Early December. And how are you catching them? Um, catch them on natural bait? No, shrimp. I mean, yeah, natural shrimp or jig head. Usually uh, right there at flood tide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll get That's usually my best time to catch them. Any of you guys got another way you catch them offshore or anything like that? Were there any bigger, like spawning? It's like, I don't know if I want to share that or not. All right, I'll give you all in on a secret. <laughs> and I just figured it out last year, but um, I went down to Jimmy's Seafood Cellar, and he had some dead crawfish, and they worked phenomenal for those sheep set. Yeah. I, and I, last year was the first year I did it, but See, they're hit or miss if he has them. If he has some, he'll call me and I'll go up there and get them. But um, that crawfish, if you can get your hands on them, those or the little fiddler grabs, I mean, all those techniques work really well. But that crawfish last year was, it was money. Mm. So what yeah, have we learned what here? Crawfish kind of sheep's head. What's, like your, uh, what's your best time for sheep's head? Thanks. It doesn't. I like it moving. The the problem is with that really hard, like a full moon is really, really tough just because that current is so strong out there offshore where I'm doing it. Um, I have moved out there to about 30 to 40 feet, and there's a pile of fish out there, and you can really fish them on any tide. It's just weight dependent. You want that thing sitting on the bottom. I carry a basically from a half ounce all the way up to a three or four ounce weight because I want that thing. I don't want any bouncing. I tell my people all the time. Let your rod, if, the, if it's even rough, just let your rod go up and down. You do not want that thing coming off the bottom. You know what we used to do for pompano and strong current deep water? Uh, we used to take a heavier jig, like a two ounce jig, and we would tie a piece of monofilament behind that with like a fly or something like that, and we would lift that jig so it just make a little puff. You'd have that. I wonder if that would work with a, with a hook behind yeah. that with the 
I'm sure it with a crawfish from the seafood. <laughs> be a way to do it. Um, pros, is there a nighttime fishery or bite in the nature coast zone? And what species is likely to be caught? Sock. Oh, yes. Yeah, I That's why I asked of, you. <laughs> a lot of night fishing. Um, it, like we covered earlier, James was saying about moving in the dark. Out. It can be dangerous. I mean, you got to know where the hell you're going. Uh, but I catch a lot of big redfish at night. And a lot of the time you'll hear, you know, you can't see anything, so you're hearing blow-ups, boom, boom. You think it's snook. A lot of these redfish are eating shrimp and stuff off the surface. Mm. And I catch a lot of redfish, snook at night, obviously. Uh, even trout. I've caught a lot of trout over the years. Bycatch. Mm -hmm. They are a nocturnal feeder. Yeah. Yeah. They're low light feeder. Summertime, I mean, the water's cooler for them that time at night. Everything's silhouetted on the big full moons. I, uh, I'm friends with Billy Henderson. He's a he's a big proponent of fishing at night, but that's because yeah. he hates people, yeah, not because it's better. It's just he just hates people. Um, he but he's to, good at it. He likes to catch fish on lures. Yes. And if you're a lure guy, nighttime is the right time because they, you know, they. Yeah. They and and you can fool them. You can fool them. James, I know you're an early riser too, so. Yeah, I mean, nighttime, you know, nighttime bite, you know. This this time of year, if I'm leaving, like, because now all the floating grass is gone, if I get out there on a, on a, you know, on a good tide and it's still dark, I'm sitting in top water. Um, you can catch snook, redfish. A lot of times, I've been out there when it's, I'll leave at, you know, 5 a.m., and I'm already, if I got three guys, before the sun comes up, we already got, they already got their fish. Mm -hmm. Now the rest of the day for me is easy. Um, so the, the, the low light nighttime stuff is definitely a, uh, it's it's fun. I mean, yeah, I gotta have the right people. Like, if they really want to, I've done it a handful of times in chartering. You gotta have the right people, you know, because like Sox said, it can be, it's dangerous. I guess to drive around out there, but uh, yes, flying. Yeah, the lures flying. flying. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's it's definitely a uh, you can definitely do it. It's just real dark out there. Yeah, I like leaving early this time of year when the water temperature is perfect. I left with Robert Neely the other day. And we came out of the back of a creek and basically stuck, checked up halfway down the creek on a flat where you could see mullet barely in the twilight kind of pushing around and got two snook and a, a big redfish like right away. I mean, just right away on top water because it was just the last part of the outgoing tide. So it was super, super skinny. The tops of the crab pots were coming out of the water. And we drilled those three fish real quick, and then the water got a little bit slack, so then I made a run to try to get to moving water again, you know. And then we caught fish on the first part of that push, but as soon as the water started getting high, then it started getting hard again. Then it was like fishing out in the open, trying to catch trout, whatever, until the tide got low in the afternoon. Um, you know, we talked earlier about what's the perfect boat. What is the perfect boat for fishing the nature coast year round, not just the mud boat, not just the air boat, but what's the perfect boat for fishing year round? I'm talking about draft and and so that you can fish productively in the winter, but you can still fish decently in the in the summer months. And when everyone asks me, you know, what's the perfect boat, I always tell them three boats. That's what I always tell them. But if you can only have one, which most of us can only have one, what is it, Adam? You really got to define what you want to do as an angler to be able to fix a boat. There is no perfect boat to do everything here. You can't, the boat that I'm taking up in the Booger Woods and the, the shallow winter stuff, you can't run 40 miles offshore. In. So you got to define what it is that you want to do. For me, a flats boat is the perfect boat because it does everything that I need it to do. JC? So yeah, it's the same thing though. You gotta pick what you want to do. Do. If you want to run offshore, big boat's great. You can still get inshore on the you know higher water and stuff like that, but if you want to spend you, you push boat, your flats boat pretty hard though. You, I see you in it most of the year. Yeah, I've had it on thirty miles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that so the answer is it's gonna be pretty it's gonna be pretty tough to to have one boat that can do everything, but better if you just have two fishing buddies and one one guy has a skinny boat and one guy has a bay boat. Probably. 
Yeah, but we're, we're moving through a lot of these questions. We're going to probably take that sure. barbecue break here pretty quick. Um, here's a question, and I'm going to go back to JC on this one. What's the earliest and latest month? So the earliest month and the latest month you can locate tarpon around the nature coast. So I start locating them around April. Okay. Like second to last week of April. And uh, I just got done fishing for tarpon at the beginning of September. So. Wow, so that's a good stretch. That's kind of, that's kind of the way it is in, in South Florida, too. It's it's almost the same schedule. Um, Brandon, anything to add to that? So that's about that's about the yeah, window. It is what it is. You'll have a few resident fish around, but to really catch them, that's, that's, that's the period you're looking at. Yes. Here's one that'll that I'll get a lot of you guys from, and then I'm gonna give my son a heads up here and let you guys break uh, for some barbecue because I know everyone gets tired of sitting in these very comfortable plastic <laughs> chairs <laughs> that you stretch your legs. So I think they're ready to Cameron, my consider this your five minute um, deal. But this this one will take a minute. Best rod and reel setup for all around inshore fishing here. I don't care what brand it is. Just the real size. What I'm really after is the real size the rod length and action, and the braid line weight. That's what I'm looking for. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask each one of you this question, so I'll start with Alice. Uh, 10 to 17-pound rod. Um, I love a lot of bull bay rods. Mm -hmm. they got great warranties on them with customers that we uh, have great mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, 10 to 17-pound with the uh, 3,000. I like Shimano, uh, a Stratix, affordable and great. If you want to get one a little better, the uh, the Twin Power is awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that setup. Um, you can catch snook, reds. Um, you can go out catch your trout. It's light enough. You can still have fun with trout. Mm -hmm. uh, very weak stout action. Uh, if you're whipping around a popping cork, a J-hook, a live bait, I like them kind of stiff, a fish stiff. Um, and I think that's that's the best setup, 1017 with the 3000 on it. You can go offshore and uh, catch a nice sheep's head. Yeah. Uh, might be outpowered by some of those better grouper. Yo, uh, yeah. So I wouldn't sure. do that, but, but for the classic inshore stuff, that, that would be my, my favorite setup right there. Brandon? I would say a medium light to a medium just because every rod company is different. Um, yeah. I like to have that tip like a really sensitive tip, but I like the backbone. Um, every single rod company, their medium light and medium is totally different. That's right. You pick up the Shimano medium light and it's comparable to like a basic, or say a Daiwa, they're, they're a little bit heavier on there. If you pick up a medium light, that's gonna be a medium yeah. Shimano. That's right. Um, so it just depends, a medium light to a medium 3000 series reel, and I use 15 pound braid, um, braid for everything basically. You get really good cast. You can catch big snook on it. It's light enough to catch the trout. Mm -hmm. uh, I change my leader size up, but always I'm pretty much around the board. 15 pound braid. Catch those groupers, sheep's head, triple tail. So good all around yep. inshore setup, Adam. So for inshore, I like 3,000 size reel, a seven foot plus rod, mm -hmm. and uh, I'll agree with him. I like medium action on that rod. For fly, nine foot, eight weight. Yep. And I like a faster action rod, so you can make the quicker pop Push shots. Cast. Yeah. James? Uh, for reels, I like to use anything from a 2500 up to like a 4000, just depending on what I'm targeting. I use 2500 a lot in the wintertime when I'm doing a lot of casting for trout. Mm -hmm. um, I use all Shimano, like the rods. Um, I'm a bull bay guy. I use anything from uh, a seven footer, especially when I'm trout fishing. Seven, but just seven. I think it's a seven two. I use. I use that a lot for trout fishing. And all my redfish rods are all, you know, medium, uh, six to twelve pounds sometimes. Mm -hmm. Eight to seventeen just depends on where I'm fishing and how I'm fishing. Yeah. And then, um, you know, for the snook, I always up everything up. And then my braid. Um, summer months I use ten pound braid, and then. And the winter months, I usually drop down to eight. Um, and I use all Power Pro Slick V2, um, which I have been using that stuff for years, and it works great. Yeah. So it all for me, it just depends on time of year and scenario, and what I'm targeting and how I'm targeting them, though. Yeah. yeah. So it just depends. JC, I'm like Brandon. I like that medium seven Maybe. plus. I like a seven and a half with a solid three thousand reel. And Brandon was talking about Iowa. 
Yeah. Yeah. Those are those are the you know the, the two big two big brands. I always throw a ten pound on the ten pound all around. Yeah. Jeremiah. Um, so I'm a Finley guy, 2500. I use medium light, medium, um, seven foot, seven six. Where I'm targeting, we're doing a lot of lures and what a thin point gas to get the seven footers. Um, 12 pound suffix, and I use that leader line anywhere from 10 to 25 pound, just depending on the how cold and everything. Else. Yeah, scenario, lures, whatnot. Sock. So I brought one of my, yeah, that green water right there. Um, that right there is a typical inshore all around. That's a 3,000 twin power with 10 pound super slick. I run all 10. Uh, that leader's awfully short on that one, but uh, yeah, that's but a, that's a seven a nine. That rod is a seven nine. I use a lot of seven sixes, mm -hmm. and I like a light. Rod. I use a lot of ultralight stuff and really whiffy stuff, but for an all around 3,000, I catch snook up to 40 inches on that combo, and you know, I, I like to use the nicer stuff. This is expensive. That's a G Limit. <laughs> What's a twin power? $450? A green? green uh, I don't know. So you that. got a thousand? This is a client rod? Yeah. <laughs> How much money are you paying him? Donnie tips me. Donnie's worth of some nice stuff. Want, right? <laughs> just to put just to put my two cents in, I mostly use eight pound braid, and it's only because I want them to be able to cast as far as they can cast. But I'm throwing artificial all the time, so I don't have to have anything heavier. And I'm typically never fishing anything deeper than four foot. Everything shallower than four foot of water. And eight really <coughs> breaks closer to twenty. Yes. And, and yeah, and it, it breaks closer to 20 when it's wet, and I just tie a really good knot system. If I think I need more tippet, I'll just I'll tie on like typically 15 pound fluorocarbon leader, and then I'll put a little piece of like 30 on the end of that, just so the bait like a like a mirroring has more action, if you will. And that way, if, if I've got a client who's 72 years old who's got a crappy shoulder that he's getting over shoulder surgery. A seven foot, you know, rod's not too heavy. It can be medium light, six to 12, maybe may eight to 14. He's still gonna be able to make a really long cast with anything that weighs between a quarter and three eighths, which when you really start adding the lures up with the jig head and the plastic and start weighing them on like a Weight Watcher scale, like don't tell your wives you're using our food scales for that stuff, but if you put a paper towel down, there'll be no evidence that there was a plastic paper <laughs> on that. You can tear it for the one piece of paper towel. And it, it is amazing because that little added casting distance on every cast, blind casting, especially because I like to fish the open stuff too, um, it'll equate to a, fit, a couple of extra fish every day. It really does. Yeah. Something none of us touched on, and I'm sure there might be a couple of guys in here that use it. What is your go to bait casting rod? Because I, I myself throw a lot of bait casting, but what is your go to bait casting rod? Pro probably a. A seven foot rod. I like a seven foot medium action rod. That way it'll cover everything from a quarter ounce all the way close to five eighths, which is the lion's share of the lure weights because I'm a big on balancing lures with rod actions. That way you're in the sweet spot and you can swing them as hard as you want without backlash. Them. If the action's too heavy, then you gotta have a heavier lure. Like when I'm throwing that Hercules now, I'm throwing like a heavy action rod. I'm throwing basically almost like a flip. What pound braid do you throw? Most of the time I throw 20. 20. I throw a 20 pound braid. On, well, I brought the rod here. I got 20 pound braid on a Tranks. This is a 150 Tranks. This is a probably a, maybe a quarter ounce, maybe 3 16 clip shrimp. Um, 20 pound braid. This is typically what I would use. 7 foot medium. 20 pound braid. This is a 150 size uh, rod set up here. And it's accurate. I can catch fish as big as I want on that. I do like using the heavier ones. Like if I'm fishing for me personally, I'll use nothing but the big, I like to use the big rods. I like Corrado 200s. Uh, and I'll still throw those on 20 or 30 pound braid. And I'll throw the big the big Hercules minnows or like the five inchers or I'll throw um, some of the bigger shad baits. The big, because that's how you catch the big snook. You know, you just make super long casts and reel it back. And when we fish the, uh, the crack of with the ladies, um, 
you had some big snook, and my girls were throwing artificial, but I made them throw long baits all day long, 4,000 reels, you know. But they caught some big snook in that tournament. So, um, all right, we're going to release you guys for a little bit of barbecue. Uh, give you a chance to stretch your legs, hit the restroom. We're going to try to convene back in here within the hour. So let's let's try to be back and start coming back up here about 1.30. Go check out some of the raffle items down there once you uh, 